Right, so you already come on the podcast before, so I guess we would need too much of an introduction, just, but if you just want to remind people of who you are. Okay. Um, my name is Rachel Winder. I am a passionate advocate for and with autistic people. I am an autistic adhd and I like to share my insight um, on life through my own autistic lens um, in hope that I can offer some level of support um, for other autistic people who are on a journey to discovering where they belong and um, you know what shape that they were yeah. intended to take as it were you know like a plant that's not growing into a box as the box has been taken off and now they realize they're autistic and they're growing into the shape that nature intended yeah and this is some something i tried to do with a podcast like people to discover and learn any way they've heard themselves enough that space to have these conversations and promote the issues that are important then mm. absolutely yeah and uh so what a reason I had you on today is because you emailed me about this petition you started on the UK government and parliament website. Yes, so that's right. Tell, yeah. yeah, so tell me all about this petition. Okay, so basically um, I am trying to get as many signatures as possible. I need 10,000, which sounds very, uh, what's the word, challenging and... Uh, yeah. But um, it already has. I think last time I looked, it has. Um, yeah, I, can, I can see for you, it says 139 signatures. Yes, that's it. Yeah. So um, I have a press release that a friend of mine helped me put together. Well, actually, she created it for me. And I added a few bits. Um, and I am going to send that to. Uh, one of the large um, media, I can't think what the word is, what do you call them? Like, um, you know, like the BBC, Sky, yeah. all that yeah, sort of stuff. organisation or computer. That's it. Yeah. Yes, that's it. Yeah. So, and hope that they can help me gain some momentum. And then, in order to maintain the momentum, um, I was thinking, this probably sounds really bizarre, but I was thinking of uh, busking in Belper of all places, um, because I can sing. And um, I thought maybe I could get someone to come with me and ask people who are passing to sign the petition. So to yeah. use my singing voice as a, I guess I suppose like a, an attraction to ask people to say, yes, would you like to sign my petition please? And hope that we gain more and more, um, numbers so that yeah. it, it gets to you know it gets through to parliament because this petition has the potential to change and improve the lives of thousands of autistic people um to allow them to be um their you know as nature intended their true autistic selves and um not be met with interventions that set out to in, the, in inverted commas, normalise us and make us appear less yeah. autistic, which has been proven to um, lead to post-traumatic stress disorder and, you know, heavy masking, so autistic masking that then leads to the um, poor mental health and heightened risk of suicide, which yeah. still stands at nine times higher than not the non-autistic population, which I think in this day and age is appalling. And so something needs to be done about it. And this petition, I hope, will mean the formation of a regulating body that will hopefully protect autistic people from the normalising interventions such as ABA, which is Applied Behavioural Analysis, because that, that has been proven to cause post-traumatic stress disorder in autistic people and is why so many autistic people are having to um, basically clear up 
the mess that was created by those who thought they were doing the right thing, but actually was incredibly harmful. Yeah, as you said, Drew, the issue of like mental health trauma, you know, all of these, men, you know, issues that are linked to negative experiences that autistic people face. It is a known yeah. fact that death by suicide is the highest cause of death in the autistic community. So I understand that this is, comes from a place of needing urgent improvements in the parents' support that autistic people face. And yes. As the petition reads, this is if, uh, and I link the petition in the podcast descriptor, this is a form of a statutory regulator for autistic, for care intervention and therapy for autistic people. So, as I said, you know, that like it's something specifically targeted for autistic people to look at and care their care services, healthcare, and reevaluate whether they are working for them. But yes. one, one thing with this I want to ask you about is what is the what do you find is the current state of the care system in particularly England as this is where the debate would be happening and it would since it's only like a thing that if you were still be to the Westminster it would on, on its health issue it would only affect uh, be able to be debated about the English health and support system. So what are the problems you faced or you learned from other people that you know that are wrong with the institutions and support services that are autistic people are referred to? Okay, so it's a great question. Thank you, Aaron. Um, for me personally, I would say that from a per from personal experience and also from shared experience of other fellow autistics that um there's there needs to be a greater understanding of autistic experience within the mental health um sector and that means from the point of contact of um any health professional so whether that be a GP or a social worker that there are there are many paths that people can go down the professionals that are that is which then lead to um misdiagnosis misunderstandings that then lead to um therapies that are or that are intended to support the autistic person because I don't think anyone sets out to harm um, autistic people. I think it's based on the ignorance of the professional who somehow might feel that they're obliged to know what autism is or that their current knowledge on autism. Um, and then that then starts a, I suppose, like a chain reaction of, well, we'll, we'll label you this you'll be giving this medication or sent to this therapy session or whatever and that then leads to the autistic person being um mistreated misdiagnosed and massively misunderstood that then leads to more distress that then leads to more trauma that then leads to outward behaviors that then might influence the professional to assume that this autistic person um, needs more, in inverted commas, help. And it, I guess it becomes sort of like a vicious cycle of, or not even just a cycle, it's like a um, spiral. It spirals, you know, into a very dark place for the autistic person. And a lot of the times it's based on someone relying on very rigid criteria, tick boxes, and... Um, and wanting the autistic person to appear less autistic because the non-autistic professional sees the autistic characteristics as something that needs to be shut down to protect the autistic person when actually if they understood about the mechanics and the reasons for the autistic characteristics like outwardly stimming and the rest of it that you know 
or many autistic people express themselves as they as nature intended that that is frowned upon by the non-autistic population and then the non-autistic professional sees that as okay so I need you to stop doing that so you don't get this negative um like come back whereas if we actually educated the non-autistic population on the differences between autistic brains and non-autistic brains that the non-autistic population would with you know with time come to accept us as a valid uh, community within society and that the society would include us and our societal values because a lot of people say that well there's one society when actually there is there is a group of human there are groups of human beings yeah. who share you know characteristics but it's it's almost as if autistic differences the differences that are often visually um perceived are seen to be wrong when actually they're not wrong they're just different mm -hmm. and so I, I can i can only see that educating professionals and enabling them to see what it's like to be autistic from an autistic perspective and to actually actively listen to us and take on board what we're saying and not counter argue our points based on their rigid criteria and actually engage with us and seek to meet halfway rather than make us more like them. Yeah. Well, that's my aim anyway. But um, whether that will be possible, probably not in my lifetime, mm -hmm. but hopefully, if there are more people, you know, doing this, the more noise we make and and the more yeah. integration of differences and helping the non-autistic population see that we are not something to be feared, we are not a threat. We are not out to take over the world. We are out to um, gain our right to a place yeah. within human society. Yeah, and as I was thinking of that, you know, that, that spread very broad stroke of an idea of like how we want people to change perceptions and be re-educated on such an important issue of re-evaluating what ought like autism should be educated at and should be defined as. And in your petition, which kind of links to this, is that you referenced the um, Autism Act of twenty of 2009, and, yeah. that, and that was something that was introduced, what feels like many of years ago now, even though it's only like two decades ago. And, yeah. and it's something that, you know, since autism is like the definition, definition of autism has changed a lot in the community understanding of autism as of like in terms of like you be like at the time you know people would be diagnosed with like Asperger's syndrome and language like that yeah and uh, that neurodivergency would wouldn't be net recognised. But do you think that there is like something that also you would think that the Autism Act of 2009 would need to be like re-evaluated, reassessed and re-looked at in, in addition to having looking into introducing a regulatory body looking at the care and support services around autistic people have? Yes, yeah, so... so um the the government have got you know the autism act 2009 and i'm just looking for the other one um because i can't remember the dates but it's it's sort of like i think it's 2021 to 2026 is it yeah you that is the national yeah. strategy that's that's the strategy that's currently going but neither of those have a regulatory body yeah. and so there is no regulatory body regulating interventions with autistic people and because autistic people not all autistic people but many autistic people are vulnerable to um professionals who are like 
unaware of what it means to be autistic and maybe that professional hasn't been given the um, option of signposting them to somebody else who does understand it that a lot of professionals feel obliged to well I'm the doctor I should know this and therefore I'll try my best but end up sharing information that has the potential to harm um, this regulatory body would set out to ensure that um, any intervention with an autistic person that the interventions that were delivered were policed, I guess, by this regulating body. So um, strategies and um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, interventions like ABA and yeah. other normalizing um, interventions would not be allowed um, to ensure that autistic people and their carers understood yeah. that they were protected to a degree from these harmful um strategies um yeah. so the you know deaf people have um a register for interpreters so you have to if you employ an interpreter yeah. for a deaf person you have to make sure that their that their name is on this register because the register is responsible for making sure that the interpreter is competent at what they do and has the rel relevant um expertise and experience um because you quite often get um family members going to interpret for um yeah. you know the deaf person and so you go to a hospital appointment um the doctor's saying that um you've been diagnosed with cancer and obviously because you're emotionally invested as yeah. a family member then you're not able to interpret if you burst into tears then you're not able to interpret and then the deaf person's sitting there going what on earth is going off you know um so again it's it's all about making sure that the services and interventions that autistic people receive are um, regulated and so reduce the um, negative implications that come from yeah. uh, interventions as, like ABA, yeah. Yeah, as you were saying with that, you know, as you saying with terms of like a deaf person would be legally required access to a, a sign language interpreter and yes yeah, so not the deaf that, not the deaf person it would be yeah it would be the person who's providing the service their responsibility to yeah. you know to to get an interpreter booked yeah. and from yeah. from that they have to get them from yeah. this register so yeah. um yeah yeah. And, yeah yeah and it's like that you know it's that thing of like having you know if they do, aren't pervaded with that that you know that would be in breach of the law. So it yes. seems that it def definitely that to introduce uh, you know a regulatory body that you know defining what you know services you know what would be against what the regulatory body you know would define as inadequate inadequate support yes. or support that would be harmful. Something that sounds like something that the legislation would need updating to an ensure that the autistic person would have the correct support and that if they had incorrect, inappropriate support to harm them, that they could take this to a tribunal as a regulatory body would be able to, because you know, whether really a regulatory body would be able to investigate this and do what has gone wrong and what broke. Uh, legal requirements for yes. that autistic person. And yes. yeah, with you, when you were mentioning like and something like ABA, you know, with, with a plate B even therapy, it's something that people with any autistic and they were divergent community see as a conversion therapy for yeah. uh, autism and they were divergent brain and behaviors. It's something, as I said, with a conversion therapy, it's like something that 
is how the uh, uh, people are campaigning for uh, banning off conversion therapies for uh, like sexuality and uh, transgender. This is something that you know, like the conversion therapies related to that, that are you know campaigning to be legally banned. So, I uh, do you think that something like ABA and anything that, in terms of, like equalities characteristics, you know, like in you know, like disabilities, so so like disability and neurodivergent uh, 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 conversion therapies be included in any legislation that would be in banning conversion therapies. Yeah, so I I, th I think it'd be something that would grow, you know. Uh, yeah. it's, it's not something that's ever been established before. So, you, you know, it's not going to be something that's going to be like, bam, and it's immediately incorporates everything. I think it would be it would be something that would have to sort of grow, almost like an organic, <clears throat> an organic kind of state where um, we establish um, a foundation of rules that then. As it as we move, you know, through time, um, will grow into the shape that ensures that many, as many people as possible are protected under this regulatory body. Um, but it's more it's more like giving like if you go on Google, you can Google stuff, and there's like ninety five percent of the stuff, probably more, that's like not reliable, potentially harmful, uh, misinformed, massively. Um, false pejorative narrative surrounding autism. Um, having this regulatory body would mean that there would be a list, so an option for a place for people to go to choose therapies and support. Um, and knowing and feeling reassured that this list of um, interventions had been, um, I guess, checked to make sure that they are um you know meeting the code of ethics that would be set by the regulating body and then with that enable autistic people to feel that they are legally represented represented and recognized um as having different needs that aren't wrong and that our autistic characteristics are not wrong, they are just different. And with that, enable professionals and carers to access a safer channel in which to uh, navigate the um okay. I guess realms of what it means to be autistic which you know there's no one definition of autism because each autistic person is unique you know like I always say there's there was never anybody like yeah. me before me and there'll never be anybody like me after me but also with that it then enables um autistic people to feel that they yeah are able to be there true natural autistic selves and also hopefully with that share that knowledge and insight um and have professionals who maybe don't understand enough but have this regulating body who does understand to then signpost them to the right people rather than just letting those professionals just choose whatever way they they think is right which you know quite often isn't and ends up resulting in harm inadvertently yeah. most likely harm to autistic people so so yeah how, how, does that answer your question Aaron I Attend think, think <laughs> to, a, to an extent I think it does as I okay. say that uh, you know it's like something that it, I get the idea that you know you want us to like petition and the debate around introducing a regulatory body to be like a seed rather than like start of any and it won't be like there yeah, are indeed and in like certain you know straightforward yeah. and you know instant legislation and you know like certain changes within the law as I guess you were hinting that yeah. it, it takes a lot of time to get 
get these things up and Andy, yeah, yeah. you just want to start a discussion and I presume yeah. from this you want to be able to work with different autism rights organisations yeah. like on to, for people within the community to establish what this means because they under, probably understand that so far with your uh, campaign and uh, petition you still feel probably like one person and you want yeah. to be able to work with other autistic people to yeah. uh, make this happen. Yes. And, and so uh, I guess I ask this, uh, you know, what what didn't like start in like uh, such a you know uh, regulatory body or anything that you know would incorporate like change in our like the support network works for autistic people like to be a cohesive, have a more definitive definition of autism and what is negative support and what is uh, positive support. Yeah, I guess you think that autistic people need to be further consulted on and involved in the uh, parliamentary discussion around this yes. and not as something that is led directly for MPs. Yes. So it's, it's almost like, you know, the simplistic, to simplify it, a gardener who's you know good at their job and understands plants is then able to identify the plant doesn't need to change. It's the environment that needs to change. Either I'm giving it too much water, it's getting too much sunlight, it's not warm enough, it's too cold or whatever. But we don't seem to apply that to people. So if like an autistic person and they, a non-autistic person who's never met an autistic person before sees an autistic person and goes, well, that doesn't feel like something that I'm familiar with. Yeah. It could be something that's not safe. Um, when actually not all differences are to be feared. And, you know, you get people who say, you know, you're sitting in a, say if you're sitting in a bar and somebody enters the room, everybody looks. Well, yeah, everybody does look, you know, because it's not about the person yeah. who's entering the room personally. It's about a new, a new person who's entered the room and is looking to identify if they're a potential risk. And once we've decided, are they a potential risk or not, then we can carry on. So if, if the professionals who often get, you know, have first contact with autistic people, then have a list of um, accredited professionals or um, societies or whatever, um to signpost people to then that means that there's more control over who this autistic person yeah. has contact with because if like you know children in schools in mainstream schools if they don't have a diagnosis quite often the school won't do anything about it when actually under the Equality Act you don't need a diagnosis in order to meet needs you have to identify need which is why I always say to people don't sit and wait on the waiting list for a diagnosis because the actual diagnosis doesn't get you anything yeah go and see you know a um again this would be on this would be on the register accredited occupational therapist speech and language therapist educational psychologist who have a good commandage of the subject of autism yeah. and have the positive narrative who are then able to you know observe and identify the profile of that individual to enable them and those around them to support them as that person has a right to be supported and not to be shut down, you know, all their, yeah. their lives kind of snuffed out. So, um, again, it's all about approaching the right people because, again, you know, an autistic child doesn't have the privileges of, of a lot of adults in the sense yeah. of, you know, being able to choose to stay or go. If they're in mainstream education and the education in itself, yeah. you know, Children, children's right to an education is protected by law. Yes, it but is. the right to an education that doesn't harm is yeah. not protected by law. So this, hopefully, this regulating body would tighten up that. Um, I yeah, don't know, kind of make it less likely that autistic people are. Yeah. 
interacting with those who have the potential to harm them. What do you think are the issues currently with either the current health, you know, uh, health boards or the health regulating bodies that would regulate a standard, you know, health service in the NHS or the current Ofsted services? And do you think that any of them would be able to be reformed to ensure that, like, if a um, school of mainstream education or, like, a general practice in a surgery could be able to, and like, be revaluate the understanding and regulate within the institutions, wherever that they are providing, like, a support for autistic and neurodivergent people within the services, as you say that, I guess, a lot of the, the idea of developing this regulatory body would also be a, a way of creating a new uh, network of registered, you know, services for autistic people at terms of diagnosis and discovery to have that kind of library or sets and, like, record of being able to have one like stop shop to find the right correct services for that but what do you think of the current uh, state of regulation in terms of self education and health care so it seems it's a great question Aaron thank you that it seems to be like a postcode lottery yeah um I've I've experienced services in Sheffield that for me have been absolutely spot on. They've listened to me, actively listened to me and my needs and allowed me to have an element of control, which has enabled me to be less anxious, therefore more able to articulate my needs and share my insight in an environment that feels safe. And then there are other health sectors where I've spoken and immediately I feel not listened to I don't feel I've got an element of control. I feel like I'm being dragged by the seat of my pants um, and that's terrifying. And then I become more anxious then less able to articulate in a way that doesn't make me appear to be some sort of neurotic female um, who's trying to articulate myself. But because I'm my anxiety is heightened, my um, access to my executive functioning is impaired because Um, I'm anxious and like any human being whose anxiety is heightened our executive function inhibition increases so um, it's all about creating an environment where we feel safe heard an element of control and that isn't exclusive to the autistic community that's it that's like a human basic human need to feel heard to feel that you belong to feel a sense of control um and that they're, they're things that I feel sh- there's, uh, that should be a basic, um, I don't know what to put, or what word yeah. to put it, but just a basic thing that should be implemented and, 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 and be a given, you know? <clears throat> just because I appear different does not make it wrong. Mm. And I think if it was explained to the non-autistic population what their brains did and what our brains did and why they were different, I think... That yeah. would be a big influence in their them seeing us as other humans rather than just other. Yeah, so I guess it's just that you feel that the current uh, regulatory services for education and healthcare and up yes. to spots to regulate uh, yes. autistic and neurodivergent support. And it's yes. that tricky something of having it you know, like you've, I guess you don't feel that it can be correctly, you know, reformed. The like the specific education and healthcare services are not. There may be like a body to ensure that they are regulated. Yes. In terms of like being able to support uh, neurodivergent and autistic people, and I guess you want to have that complaints process or the. Uh, you know, the appeal process of an autistic person going into the regulatory body and contacting them with forms, yes. I guess, to make that more accessible for them. Yes. Well, if, 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 if 
all humans benefit from a low arousal environment so an environment that makes yeah. them feel safe and because of that yeah. they are then able to better access yeah. education and therefore learn more yeah. and feel safe and feel like a valued member of society um then surely just applying that as a blanket approach, which doesn't harm the non-autistic people, enables autistic people to feel a sense of belonging and safety. And if it benefits all human beings, why is that not something that can't just be implemented as a given? As yeah. a name, this is just the foundation for all human needs. Because, you know, like I always say, a reward to one person could be seen as a... Yeah. A punishment to another you know it's all about perspective and not assuming that one perspective is written in stone and that should be applied to everybody because that's not that is not the case and I think the, the sooner that environments are adapted so that they I mean everybody needs a little bit we all need to have a little bit of drive in us so yeah. there are like basic levels of anxiety that enables us to function at our best but yeah. if it goes too low or too high like anything anything that's out of yeah. balance it starts to malfunction and it's always yeah. assumed that we're we the autistic people are the ones who have to make the changes when we don't have we don't have those privileges to make those changes and as children who don't have the adult privilege to decide yeah. on whether they stay or go in school they have to go to school by law but if that school schooling or that education system is harming them and because the harming isn't obvious because it's, yeah. you know, they haven't got br bruises and cuts and grazes, but they're all happening internally, then they're just like, well, we'll just carry on. Well, why? When there's all this research to show that the harm is going to happen, it's just you can't see it. I don't understand this issue with not being able to see something, therefore it's not there. Well, you know, we can't see gravity, but we know it's there, you know, and before it was yeah. named gravity, we, we weren't all bobbing around, you know, floating in the air. Uh, we were all experiencing gravity well before it was yes. um, labelled, you yeah. know, so. But, yeah, all right. Is that, so you were saying that, you know, that you find that, you know, education, uh, like, uh, for, uh, like authorities and healthcare authorities, you know, like on to scratch over the main main uh, mainstream services, and you feel that they aren't able to reform themselves. And yeah. so, like with that, I guess you had like been able to read many people's lived experiences, yeah. and you know, like situations of the health services or health boards that have felt felt sort. And of course, like we've seen, like many kinds of these things where have like reported on like so it's like BBC Panorama in terms of like healthcare and health services and yeah. in terms of these things you know it seems that unless there are neurodivergent autistic people leading these healthcare reforms and can and consulting what needs to be regulated and what should be the defined issues of what a positive and negative, uh, uh, you know, service. So yeah. do you feel that, that this is something that when it comes to debate in Parliament, that you would like to see them say that the consultancy for this and wherever it goes on with this, you know, regulatory board, that this should be led by autistic and they would divergent people, not they would, you know, holistic people who don't have the, you know, lived experiences of yeah. autistic people who yeah. use services. Yes, absolutely. So, so like, um, you know, if if you're going to, if if you say, for example, I mean, this this pretty, this seems pretty simple to me, but um, you know, I'm not assuming that everybody else sees it this way because I think in pictures. So, yeah. If you're going to find out what it might be like to be blind, you don't go and ask sighted people. You ask blind people and you don't just yeah. ask one blind person because that's one blind person's perspective of what it's like to be blind, because obviously you can be born blind and acquire it. Uh, yeah. You know, 
acquire it sort of um, in your lifetime. Um, whereas for autistic people, you are born autistic. It's not something you acquire and it is, you know, genetic um, and it isn't a mistake. And if you're going to rely on the medical model and the DSM criteria to decide what autism is, then you're relying on data that came from traumatized autistic people assessed in environments that couldn't and wouldn't meet need, therefore causing more distress and only getting the feedback of what autistic people, how they might present when, again, further traumatized. To me, that seems like, like massively unethical. And how is that even still running today that we decide on whether somebody's autistic based on a criteria that comes from research that was gained in that unethical way? Um, and I think sometimes when people learn this, they're horrified that this is actually happening. But again, this is why I'm trying to push for this petition to get a regulatory body, because I think it's, you know, now it's enough is enough. We know if we know what we know now and we're not doing anything about it, yeah. then surely that is not OK. And so yeah. this hopefully could be if it's seen in Parliament and hopefully passed and is allowed to be set up has the potential to save thousands of autistic people's lives. And that includes those people who don't yet know that they're autistic, because again, regardless of what statistics say, if not, if I went, if I, if I went to the age of 40, not knowing I was an autistic ADHD, how many other people are in the, you know, will are like that to this day, not knowing that they're autistic ADHD, but, um, just thinking that they're a broken human being because they're constantly being given expectations that never belong to them. And that to me is what I always say, you know, expectations belong only to the person who created them and they have no right to place those expectations on other people because yeah. they have the potential to harm. Um, and if I understand myself, I can then create my own list of expectations based on my own abilities. So like in the morning when I get up and I'll go, right, you know, my profile never stays the same. Yeah. One day I, I'm able to articulate myself well, other days I'm not able to speak. Some days I'm able to be quite physically active and get jobs done around the house, other days I'm not able to be physically active at all. Some days I am mentally active, but not physically. So it's, you know, that kind of just waking up, seeing what I can expect of myself from that day. And then basically planning my day around my ability to function. And that's yeah, what I always say to people. Don't own the expectations of others because they, they don't know you like you know you. Yeah. And I guess from this, it seems like, you know, it's trying to, like, get uh, Parliament to really, like, represent and democratise uh, support for autistic people and ensure that on, like, issues that affect us, we yeah. are re represented. And I guess this is going beyond just a regulatory body and open to have very different that makes the autistic people feel more represented on areas that affect themselves. And yeah. by the seems this this potential art you may think that, you know, whether like cross government departments, like whether it's like looking at like the home department of uh, you know, policing and to to like justice in terms of like legal aid, legal support for autistic and neurodivergent people under to whether to the like the benefit system of Department of Work and Pensions. It seems that you might think that there's, you know, a call for conversation wider around, you know, like areas where, as you say, that autistic people often feel included, listened to, and, you know, are contributive 
to autistic people's trauma and where the state, the government, parliament seem to be not understanding autistic people, not listening to autistic people and making them feel excluded from the political conversations around the uh, issues. Yes, and because, uh, you know, for a lot of things to become legal, obviously it has to go through that system. Yeah. So although my petition doesn't seem to have got much, um, you know, gained much momentum, I think that's probably because there are so few people who understand the implications of harmful interventions for autistic yeah. people. And so this is why I was thinking, if I explain, like with you, Aaron, yeah. why and the importance of this regulatory body, yeah. um, that hopefully it might help people see that, okay, I have I have um, the potential to add my name to this uh, petition that could improve the quality of life and also save the lives of autistic people, regardless of whether you are autistic or know an autistic person. We are human beings. All autistic yeah. people are humans, but not all humans are autistic. And I think that, you know, if you're that kind of person who's happy to contribute, regardless of whether you're autistic, you're not, or you know an autistic person, that you contribute on the basis of everybody has a right to feel accepted to be themselves yeah. and that by contributing to this petition um you know you you are just by your one vote increasing the chances of autistic people being protected yeah. by legislation that stops us being normalized you know and 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 to, to sort of grow up and think that there's something wrong with you yeah um, and that you don't belong and that your way is different and it's less well that's that's massively harmful and if the statistics of suicide comparing non-autistics with yeah. autistics is nine times higher for autistic people compared to non-autistic people and we're in 2023 with all of the access services resources the internet all of this that we have access to yeah. and there's nothing to protect us then this is why i'm like this this is hopefully the start of something that has the potential to protect us and enable us to be our true authentic, authentic yeah. autistic selves you know yeah and it's like you no know, uh, democratic channels that are open to all artists, everyone, you know, universally throughout the country, as such as like a uh, parliamentary uh, petition to start the conversation on autism, you know, autism rights and autism issues. As yeah. like from your past experiences, you know, when you've been on a podcast, yeah. I was referencing your experience when you went on a BBC and talking about the social media conversation. Yes. And it seems like a lot, lot of the conversations I tried to have is about, you know, like changing the narrative of what people discuss about autism in, in the mainstream media. And it's something that you feel dissatisfied. And since there's no uh, autistic, openly autistic people within the Westminster Parliament, anyway that you know people do feel excluded yep. from it so I, I think I assume that it's just finding your way to get people talking about autism issues and trying to put them on to an agenda and uh, you know parliamentary uh, you know uh, questions and within a uh, parliamentary debate. Yes so so the thing I found is with not all media, but some, yeah, um, it's all about, it all seems to be focusing on sensationalization. So, um, which I disagree with because, you know, this is about real people's lives and the quality of their lives. And 
for me as an autistic ADHD to have experienced the distress and trauma that I have and that that's a constant battle internal battle of mine so while I'm having to deal with my own internal trauma and then also having to navigate a world that isn't designed for me in mind while also trying to parent two neurodivergent children is incredibly difficult incredibly challenging and this is not something to be taken lightly because I'm not the only person experiencing the difficulties and having to, you know, basically the same situation that I'm in. I'm not the only autistic person that's that's living this. Um, and I think that to be acknowledged as an autistic person with my own unique autistic characteristics and being invited to feel that I can be my true autistic self is a huge, um, I don't know, a huge, I can't think of the word. What yeah. am I looking for, Aaron? But is it, is it, and it's not even, it's not a gift. It's not a talent. It's not, I think it's, I have a right to be my true authentic, authentic self. As yeah. long as I'm not harming myself or those around me, why can't I just be myself? Why yeah. is it that me stimming in public is frowned upon and I'm expected to stop doing it for the comfort of others? Well, I'm doing this to comfort myself because the environment is incredibly challenging. And for a non-autistic person who doesn't have to stim because their environment is designed with their brain in brain type in mind to ask me to subjugate my needs when their needs are always being met and mine aren't I think is incredibly offensive rude arrogant and ignorant and so if people who are using say um you know a product that's a fruit with a bite taken out of it um designed by an autistic person and yes they make lots of money and I personally find because of being a visual thinker their products work with my brain wiring but again it's about okay so an autistic person created this and we're making money from this therefore it's okay to be autistic in this way but if you're autistic in a way that actually causes me discomfort yeah I, I think that's incredibly rude and dismissive and fickle and uh short-sighted and the rest of it all those other negative words that go with it and to kind of go actually the stuff that you do as a non-autistic person that causes me distress but I have no right to ask you to change because I know I've been raised to feel like I'm not a valid member of society and that you yeah. are and that I should um, try to be more like you when actually I'm fine as I am and I can be my true authentic autistic self just like you can be your true authentic non-autistic self um, so again it's all about giving us a platform to share our experiences yeah. so that our differences aren't feared they are just accepted because it almost almost like our stimming becomes background noise the yeah. more the more people see it the less of a difference it will be therefore the less fear and hopefully with that the less sort of um shutting down of our natural autistic ways yeah exactly and it's something that it seems that from uh, you know doing this petition and you know, speaking out on this issue that it seems are you hopeful for trying to uh, like inspire, galvanize and listen to other autistic people and get a more communal feel on this and yeah. you know uh, open a way to conversation in spaces yeah. where we should feel included and viewed and just carving out the space where we should do that. Yes. And it's great, you know, like doing it because you know it's Something that, you know, I guess you hope to see like a growing, you know, a con like conversation and support on such issues. And I guess trying to inspire people to, if they got their own ideas, to, res you know, uh, resolve things and improve yeah. things to be able to, to put them forward. And it's yeah. better to see that you, you already got like up to four, 
142 signatures now anyway. Well, that's from good. Getting piece of bit since we've been talking. Oh, that's and, good. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, and one thing I wanted to ask you about this is, you know, you, like it specifically states uh, interventions, uh, like regulated care interventions and therapy for autistic people. Did you think that, that maybe this should have included uh, like people with like learning difficulties, learning different uh, disabilities or intellectual disabilities that also can mental the neurodivergent umbrella and of any neurological conditions that can co occur with autistic people? Yes, absolutely. So my take is that the services, so the, the regulatory um, body itself would then have sub um, categories to support autistic people in all, you know, from all walks of life because um, it would need to meet need on an individual basis and that must always remain uh, the main focus and not saying right well this person has this 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 and this label therefore we should do this it should always be about meeting need on an individual basis and with that connecting with an autistic person establishing how they work what works best for them um, establishing a common uh, channel to communicate um, whether that be visually um, verbally written however that person however that person is able to communicate that we are again like I said before meeting need on an individual basis so um, it would it would need to incorporate the expertise of other autistic people to run the subgroups who are experienced both lived experience and acquired experience um, from working with other autistic people with learning disabilities and those with learning difficulties because they're you know very different um, and making sure that um, the resources the interventions are um, what's the word uh, almost like you know identifying that okay within this regulatory body this service is going to be useful but we need the added um connection of this other service as part of this regulatory body with people who are um lived experience and acquired experience in the sense of knowledge and professionals and qualifications um that enable us to work as a team to support the individual autistic would that is that what you're i'm just ask. i was asking that you know like for those who have have uh, you know those have uh, like neurodivergent or neurological conditions like intellectual disabilities to learning disabilities and difficulties do you think that in a way to umbrella that like it should have been worded to also include them beyond oh, I see. autism, yeah. yeah. Well, it would have it would have been ideal to be able to do that, but sadly, whether it, it it's quite rigid in the uh, character count, which includes the spaces between the words. So, the title only had eighty characters allowance for the petition, and then the next section again is limited. So it, it took me a long time to. Um, with the support of um, Nick Chown, helping me, because um, my my command of English is okay, you know, but it's not as good as Nick's. And he was able to help me find the right words. So I explained to him what I was wanting to achieve. I wrote it all down and then he helped me kind of fit it into the word count because I tend to be quite flowery and go on. <laughs> um, and so he helped me, you know, fit it into the word count. So it's because, it's not because I haven't considered that. It's actually just because when you write, yeah. uh, if you're going to create your own petition, you are restricted as to how many words you're allowed. So yeah, that's and, why I had to limit yeah. it. And like uh, it's something that sounds that if you were to be able to put, you know, like involved with speaking out on this, just further than 
this podcast and seen more than what you have here, then, yeah. you know, like it was it's something that you probably would address, you know, yeah. in the, like the future beyond this. Yes. So so the, the again about the restriction of the word count, yeah. it always has to maintain that it's about autistic people, regardless of additional yeah. disabilities, additional characteristics, um, additional labels. The person has to be identified as autistic, whether that be a clinical diagnosis or self um, identification. Um, so again, it's under the umbrella of being autistic. So because non-autistic people can experience additional disabilities separate from being autistic, that's why I just chose as in the word autistic and autism, because if I start, if I just had it being learning disabilities or learning difficulties and whatever, then that could include non-autistic people, which is not what I want because non-autistic people already have that protection because the world is designed with their brain type in mind. So mine is about focusing on autistic brains and how we process the world and that we don't have the same privileges that non-autistic people have. So again, that's why I just said autistic people. Yeah. I did actually want to say folks, but I didn't know whether that would be allowed in a yeah. government petition. But yeah, yeah. so... Uh, yeah. So, as I said, you know, we're making it specific to autistic people then. And, you know, it's yes. something that you, like, will make clear, you know, like the press statement. And yes. so you're saying that you, like, release a press statement. So where will people be able to uh, find out more from this? And yes. where, where should people be expected to learn more, uh, find more about this campaign? Yes, absolutely. So if you um, click on the link, which I guess, Aaron, you'll probably include because yeah. you're very good at all that and I'm not, <laughs> um, and just sign the petition. It's really quick. It doesn't take much time. And once you've signed it, you just have to click on the link that you'll get sent to your email. So check your junk mail, you know, because sometimes they do go in there by mistake. And then all you've got to do is click on the link and that's it, done. Um, you can also yeah. click to say that you want to follow, you know, you want to hear what happens. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so if, you know, any anybody and everybody can sign this petition if they, you know, mm. want to support other human beings who are massively at, at a massive disadvantage because of the way society is designed and because of the you know the huge misunderstandings and the pejorative narrative that still surrounds autism that lives are at risk and then the quality of lives are much um experienced at a much l lesser value or um not you know, like just having to cope all the time is not living being able to thrive the right to thrive is what i feel every human being regardless of neurotype has a right to and so if you if you again feel the same, please sign the petition and be reassured that you are doing your little bit to contribute towards improving the lives of thousands of autistic people. And one thing, last one thing I want to ask you is about like that's a sprung to mind is about the Oliver McGowan uh, campaign to introduce better like health care training and I think you might be aware of that campaign by Paul McGowan. Yes, and so yeah. what do you, do you think of that campaign and how do you think that has helped improve uh, support for autistic people and people with learning disabilities you know in their uh, health care? Yeah I think this is uh, I can't I don't think the words I'm going to say are going to do it any justice I think um the fact that it's mandatory training is absolutely amazing and has the potential to save thousands of lives and improve the experiences of autistic people and autistic people with learning disabilities um, within the health sector because it is the there's almost it's almost like how I visually describe it is like autistic and non-autistic people and then there's like one 
one of us is on one side of the um cliff and the other on the other side and then there's a big drop in between where a lot of information just disappears in the miscommunication the misunderstandings and again the assumptions of professionals who feel obliged that they should know what to do and who don't listen to the voices of um the autistic people and their carers and loved ones and assume that they know best because of their medical training, which hasn't included, historically included the needs of autistic and learning disabled people, um, which has resulted in, you know, thousands of deaths that could have been avoided. And to someone, you know, who, if this hasn't happened to you, you just go, well, it, it happens to other people. It doesn't happen to me. Um, you know, to be disabled isn't isn't something like you're not part of an exclusive group where it only happens to you. Anybody at any point in their life can become disabled. If you, you know if you've caught COVID and you've got long COVID, you've experienced disability because compared to the life you had before COVID, your life is probably considerably very different and the yeah. way that you have to try and navigate the world and cope whereas before maybe you weren't having to cope you were actually thriving again this just you know emphasizes that nobody as is, is um nobody is what's the word i think it begins with a r or immune nobody is immune from becoming disabled you know you can have an accident an illness whatever and then you become disabled and only then will you experience life as a disabled person and realize how isolating and restrictive and belittling it can be because of the rigidity and the ignorance that surrounds disability because I, I can't remember it's quite a while ago probably last year I was reading up about the percentage of people who still look down on disabled people as being lesser individuals than non-disabled people and I just find that I just find it mind-boggling that people still today have that belief that disabled people are, are lesser and so if there are professionals working in hospitals um and they are yeah. interacting with autistic and um, learning disabled people, and their assumption is that they're a lesser person, then, and then again, if that person can't advocate for themselves and their carers are, and loved ones are having to do that, and then the health professional is ignoring that, to me, that's a massive red flag of, you really need to step back from this job and, you know, continual professional development with training like the um, Oliver McGowan mandatory yeah. training. Um, I think you know it. It can it can only improve things as okay. they are now because it cannot it cannot continue this way. And anyone who loves somebody else, yeah imagine them being in that same situation and you not being able to have any influence on what healthcare they're given and then somebody else who doesn't know them but is qualified to give a medication that then results in yeah. the death of your loved one I think then you'd probably be saying actually this this should be just a given it should just be part of their training and if they yeah. don't pass it or at any point they you know, go against the ethics of the training, um, yeah. that they are, you know, not allowed to practice yeah, until yeah. they can show that they are competent at meeting the needs of disabled people. Yeah. And, you know, this this is something that was an incredibly important thing for Paula McGowan, Oliver McGowan's mother to have done. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. it's been incredible things then after the tragic loss of her son, I turned to her that with its GP's hospital staff and yep. see where what uh, specific healthcare and and understanding and listening to autistic people have. And I think this 
like idea of a regulator kind of it's like kind of builds on that and makes sure all that stuff is yep. regulated Absolutely, at the national yeah. level and and from that what you were saying earlier about you know like self-identification of uh autism so to be included in this so do you think that the like as all of McGowan's uh you know campaign has been ma- you know mandated now in uh law and such yeah but do you think that should be the same for people who self-identify as autistic people so they uh, can legally identify or be mandated identify as autistic without yeah. you know or, or you know or, uh, opposition from a medical professional and yeah. that the regulator said you know into a lot yes absolutely so it if i regardless of whether i have a diagnosis or not i have a right to have my needs met yeah um and if my basic needs are not being met and then that's resulting in me experiencing distress and therefore harm, then surely I have a right to have those needs met so I don't experience distress and then harm. Um, it, to me, it's all about saying autism isn't a disease. There's, you know, there's no cure. There should never be a cure that's looked for. And um, I strongly believe that if you got rid of all autistic people, that the human race would be done for because the way our brains work, as like in a football team, not everyone's going to be good at being a goalie, otherwise the team would fail. Yeah. Um, if everyone, you know, if everybody had the same brain type and that there was a fungus or a disease or something that affected that brain type we would be wiped out so to have the variety of brain types is in my opinion essential for our survival yeah um so you know um, like rabbit rabbits and myxomatosis not not all rabbits were killed by myxomatosis therefore rabbits still exist and, um well, you know yeah. that, that's um, really um, do you know if i'm talking about a petition do you think but do you encourage people, you know, if they sign the petition and, of course, within the United Kingdom, to, you know, ensure that it does get debated in Parliament and that MPs turn up to debate this if it does get through the threshold of the 10,000 signatures, that, you know, right into the local MP to encourage that they support this and would attend a debate on it. Would you yes. encourage people to write to a local MP? Yes, absolutely, definitely. So my local MP is, um, you might have to edit this bit because there'll be a bit of a pause. I can see her face, but I can't think of the name. Pauline Latham. Yeah. And I have been communicating with Pauline Latham for many years now to help me fight for the rights for my child to an education that doesn't harm. And because of... Um, I basically like to do this petition. I asked, you know, it, is there any regulatory body? And if there isn't, which I believe there isn't, how do I go about doing this? And so Pauline replied to me explaining what was already in place with the government, which is what I mentioned with the Autism Act and the strategy 2021 to 26. Um, and that there was no regulatory body, which is why I mentioned it in the petition to say that there isn't a regulatory body and that there needs to be one so that autistic people are protected and that we are allowed to be our true authentic selves and thrive as autistic people, not just cope. Um, and so um, the response I got was, you know, I can't sign the petition. I can't really get involved because they've got so much, so much other stuff going off which totally appreciate um but i mentioned that i'd communicated with them and that i'd also delivered autism training to parliament before and that would they be interested in you know what happens and and what i was asking for um so i sent i sent pauline the content of my petition and she responded with uh, yes please keep me up to date with you know what happens so if anybody else would like to communicate 
with their local MP or because I think that's what you have to do. You have to communicate with your local MP um, to say um, that you believe yeah. in this and that you are behind it. Um, then that would be great. Um, but I think for now, we need to get as many names on the petition as possible to gain and to give it the power that it needs in order to get to Parliament for it then to be considered. Yeah. Um, so hopefully with this that you've kindly um, given me the space for, Aaron, and uh, the, my other friend, um, who uh, Vicky, who has given me uh, the um, press release um, support, then hopefully this can gain some momentum and get the, you know, get the names and numbers yeah. behind it that it needs in order for it to get to Parliament and actually be considered. Um, I mean, it might, it might take, it might mean that I actually have to do this, run this again yeah. um, and keep kind of making more and more people aware of why this is important and how influential this governing body, this regulatory body could be. Then maybe if I tried again in future, if this one, this petition flopped, that I could hopefully gain more momentum. Um, so yes, if anybody's willing to share, add their name, I would great, great, greatly appreciate it. And I'm sure many other autistic people would also thank you for giving them the opportunity yeah. to be protected um, from, you know, the potential of harm from those who really don't understand what it means to be autistic. Ah, uh, great thanks. And is there anything else you wish? would like to say um i'm not sure i suppose it's all about i suppose essentially meeting need on an individual basis um and accepting that differences are valid and essential and that all humans have a right to feel accepted and to you know and to appreciate that the word disability is not a dirty word, you know, it's not something to be ashamed of, and that anybody can become disabled, and that autistic people are disabled often because the environments that we're subjected to and expected to perform within, with a skill set that we are not innately born with is you know just so unrealistic and harmful and inhumane and we have a right to thrive just as the non-autistic population do and I hope that one day I and others like me won't have to keep petitioning for a right to be our natural autistic selves. Oh, thanks for coming on the podcast. Yeah, oh, thank again. you very much. Thank you, Aaron. You're so yeah. lovely. Thank you for being. You're welcome. I, I always find your um, podcast very, I feel very relaxed.